Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Patcast. Today, we are happy to welcome back Dr. Fausto Rodriguez from John Hopkins Hospital, and he is going to continue his Neuropath lecture series. So, this is his sixth lecture in the series, which is entitled Embryonal Neoplasms. And as always, feel free to post your questions or comments on our Facebook window as well as YouTube live windows. We would be happy to pass on the questions to Dr. Rodriguez at the end of the lecture. So over to you, Dr. Rodriguez. All right. Well, uh, as, as I, I'm happy to be here again uh, discussing a very important topic in surgical neuropathology and an area that has in, uh, undergone a lot of changes and that is still evolving. But uh, at least I want to show some illustrative examples, at least to approach uh, most of the cases, uh, some of the more common cases they're going to encounter in this area. I want to start, we're going to be discussing a lot about medulloblastoma, which is one of the main embryonal tumors in the pediatric population. It's almost a prototype of the embryonal tumor problem uh, in, in surgical neuropathology. And there are a lot of subgroups that have been proposed over the years, but this is a, a well-referenced uh, paper in, in, in figure, which shows the most, uh, the four groups that are being subjected to the most consensus uh, in, in, within medulloblastoma that they are used uh, frequently for uh, clinical trial uh, uh, purposes. So you have the WIN subgroup, uh, the Sonic Hedgehog subgroup, and then group three and group four, which for practical purposes are, uh, can be lumped into the uh, non wind non Sonic Hedgehog uh, category. We'll uh, discuss some examples of those tumors. This is a 2016 WHO classification of medulloblastoma. There are two approaches to it. The, you can have medulloblastoma that is histologically defined. These categories have been with us for a number of years, for, for, for a long time, and, and we still can recognize that you do have some association with molecular characteristics in some of these histologic subgroups, and, and sometimes you can incorporate it in your, in, in your diagnosis which are classic desmoplastic nodular uh, medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity and large cell anaplastic, this one having a particularly associated with a, a bad uh, outcome. Then you have the genetically defined. This is a new addition to the WHO in 2016, in which we're now seeing incorporation of genetic findings into categories and reflects some of those consensus medulloblastoma subtypes, including a wind activated sonic hedgehog and non wind non sonic hedgehog groups. With that, we'll start with the cases. We have a seven-year-old boy with, with history of headaches, that's case number one, with nystagmus and photophobia for several months. MRI demonstrated an obstructive hydrocephalus and 4.5 centimeter mass compressing the fourth ventricle. Hopefully you were able to see some of the cases. This is the histology, and from low power, you can see that the tumor is really blue and composed of these uh, cells that have high nucleocytoplasmic ratios. So you can start from the viewpoint of a round blue cell tumor. Mitotic activity is variable. You do have a, a, some vessels that are a bit hypertrophic. Okay. But the tumor looks very similar in many areas. There's no significant enlargement of the cells. You can argue that some areas that are suggestive of neuropeel or neuronal processes, that's another morphologic clue of what we may be dealing with here. So in the posterior fossa, we have this in a young child. The main uh, uh, consideration, of course, is metulloblastoma. Uh, and this is what uh, what this is. Uh, as far as histologic subtype, 
this will be what we put in the in the rubric of classic medulloblastoma, the classic histology, in which there's no much pattern to it. It's just a round blue cell uh, tumor, um, which essentially has very little in the way of, of pattern or, or specific features. Okay, we're gonna go to see some immunostains now. So a good marker to start with for medulloblastoma is synaptophysin, since most, almost all medulloblastomas show neuronal differentiation of various degrees, and it's a good way to start to confirm that the tumor is has some neuronal differentiation, and synaptophysin is a good marker. It will label the cells, and it will also label areas uh, of neuropil that are suggestive of stroma, neuronal differentiation in the stroma. So at least we are starting with a neuronal uh, tumor. Uh, GFAP is mostly negative, unless, uh, but you can have sometimes focal positivity. And then after that, we are look, we kind of once you feel comfortable, you're in the medulloblastoma camp. Another immunostain that uh, sometimes that can be useful is uh, INSM1 for neuronal differentiation in the CNS. This is INSM1. You, uh, probably you are more um, familiar with this marker in the setting of uh, neuroendocrine tumors, uh, but this is also a good marker for uh, neuronal differentiation in, in a variety of, of, of CNS tumors. And you can use it as another uh, marker for confirmation. Once you know that that you're dealing with that, let me see. There's a GFAP here, just to see what it looks like. And there is this one had a bit of GFAP as well, but most of the time, what you see is, uh, are these uh, large astrocytes with reactive appearance and a lot of processes in between. So now we know that we are with medulloblastoma. The next, the next step is to try to subtype it. And, and three immunostains that are helpful are uh, beta-catenin first, which uh, you look for nuclear reactivity, nuclear reactivity characterizing the wind subgroup. And we are not seeing that here. This is more in membranous and cytoplasmic. So that's the normal pattern for beta-catenin. Then you have YAP, which stains vessels normally, um, but in, it is uh, one of the markers that recognizes the it, wind is positive in wind and also in Sonic Hedgehog. That's what's negative here. And then you have GAP1, which recognizes the Sonic Hedgehog. So the combination of, Sonic, of GAP1 and GAP1 reactivity uh, recognizes the Sonic Hedgehog uh, subgroup, and we see here that it's also negative. So the diagnosis here is medulloblastoma, non-wind, non-sonic hedgehog, and uh, that is still allowed at the WHO. This encompasses these tumors can be grade three, a uh, group three or group four. It's a bit more tricky to separate those with uh, your, our surrogate markers. You probably need um, a gene expression uh, profiling or methylation profiling to be able to separate those two. Uh, sometimes the main thing is to identify the ones that probably have some adverse features like large cell. If you have anaplasia, severe anaplasia, you have to consider that maybe it's part of the group three and maybe has a uh, meek amplicons, which is a, is a poor uh, prognosis factors as well. So if you want to do another step here will be to probably check for meek amplification uh, if you can, if because those that have it are in, in these subgroups are tend to be to have a, a poor prognosis. Next case is a nine-year-old boy with nausea and vomiting for several months and recent development of headaches. And this is what you have. Again, you have a enhancing, contrast enhancing mass. It's kind of filling the fourth ventricle. So 
So we're going to case number two. Going on high power. We are again dealing with a small round blue cell tumor in the posterior fossa of a young boy. So again, medulloblastoma is a leading consideration. Again, there's no significant nuclear enlargement. A few of the cells have small nucleolus, uh, but um, nothing to get very excited about with regards to, to anaplasia. Some of it may represent a, a neuronal differentiation in part. And let's see what the markers show. So this is beta catenin. And you can argue here that most of the cells have kind of this uh, cytoplasmic blush and um, membranous pattern of staining. But if you look around, you can argue that there is also weaker nuclear staining in some of the cells. And this has been an issue with some of the cases. Uh, they have, we have seen some wind activated uh, medullos in which the findings are very, very focal and very easy to miss. So uh, it's good to take, spend your time uh, with beta catenin in particular, with other things. So here, you can argue there are a few cells here and there that have nuclear staining. Very subtle. Sometimes it's equivocal, and you have to then try other techniques uh, to confirm it. This one, I, I place it for that particular reason, because it's not, uh, I wanted to sh share it, because you do have some subtle here nuclear reactivity, which at the time was, for me, a bit equivocal. Now, we look for GAB. And we see that gap uh, was negative. This is because sometimes can have a blush like this. That's not non-specific. So probably it's not Sonic Hedgehog. And we have yap, which was focally positive. So this is a little bit strong nuclear and cytoplasmic. So yap one is positive in the wind and the Sonic Hedgehog. The lack of gap one goes more with is more suggestive of a wind subtype. So we have a, a beta catenin that is focally positive as well. Uh, but this one went to molecular and actually had a beta catenin mutation. So this is, if you're able to test for that, that is uh, very good um, evidence that this is a wind activated uh, subtype. They also tend to have monosomy six, chromosome whole chromosome monosomy uh, uh, loss, uh, chromosome six loss. So this is the wind activated subtype and it's important to recognize it's probably the rarest sub molecular subtype of medulloblastoma, but it has the best prognosis and uh, there are efforts of trying to, to have trials in which uh, other therapies are uh, given or um, uh, the aggressive therapies that are used for conventional medulloblastoma are kind of toned down a bit. There's still some uh, learning to be done with that, but the important thing is that the prognosis in these patients is very good. Moving to the next case, this is a 28-year-old uh, man with a cerebellar mass, 28, so not uh, a PITS case necessarily. Well, you indeed again have a tumor in the cerebellum that is very similar to the cases that I was showing uh, earlier. Very cellular, back to back cells. 
And you can argue this that a larger differential diagnosis here being an adult. So you have to exclude gliomas, other things, ependymomas, mets, and adults as well. So you have a lot of tumors that can have this appearance. But something that is very helpful, you look around, you're starting to see, hopefully you look the slide very uh, around, you're starting to see these nodules here, nodules. And if you go there, you can have a, 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 some impression that there is a uh, fibular stroma suggestive of neuronal differentiation. And this is a morphologic expression of neuronal differentiation. This is very helpful when you see it uh, because it tends to be associated with neuronal neoplasms and brinal neoplasms. It's a bit more cellular in the internodular regions and you have these very nice nodules in between. They can be in focal areas of the tumor or can they can be a dominant and you can argue there are some cells here that start streaming almost on a on, as a single cell uh, which is a reflection of the desmoplasia that accompanies the internodular areas of this tumor So something that allows you, that is uh, can help in, in more subtle sort of cases to identify these um, desmoplasia and nodules is a very old stain that has been with us for a long time and it is uh, reticulin. You can see this is here in the internodular area. You have a lot of reticulin deposition and you see the nodules here. So this is very typical of this uh, histologic subgroup of medulloblastomas, histologic defined, which is the desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma. You have these nodules, and then you have this internodular desmoplasia, which is highly characteristic of this subtype. Now, it's, this, it's, it's nice to recognize this because all of these tumors are part of the Sonic Hedgehog activated subgroup. So it's, it's almost like a morphologic surrogate of an important uh, molecular um, medulloblastoma subtype. But you can recognize many times at the h &E level and sometimes with reticulin that helps you uh, a, a little bit clinch it. So, but we have the stains and we can go to the next step. And this is GAP1. So you see strong GAP1 expression confirms that this is probably a Sonic Hedgehog type tumor. GAP1. And then you have here JAP1, which sometimes can be focal. Here you're having it mostly in vessels, but you can argue that there is a subset of tumor cells in areas that have also positivity for JAP1. So the diagnosis here is medulloblastoma, we uh, Sonic Hedgehog activated, uh, and you can argue, you can place it either in the diagnosis or in the uh, comment as this is corresponds to the desmoplastic uh, nodular subtype. It is, you notice that this patient was 28, it's important to highlight medulloblastomas occur in adults. That when they, when it happens, usually these are young adults. And this is the uh, one of the most common subtypes that you're gonna see represented in uh, an adult medulloblastoma patients, which is the nodular desmoplastic at uh, the histologic level and Sonic Hedgehog at the molecular level. We did also a uh, next generation sequencing at the clinical request and this demonstrate and it had a sm smoothing mutation confirming that it has an alteration in this uh, Sonic Hedgehog pathway. There were no P53 mutations or MIC amplifications, which are two important um, uh, items to uh, alteration to exclude. In the context of Sonic Hedgehog, uh, the presence of TPP53 mutations must, it has to be uh, added uh, if possible. One way to screen for this is to look for strong nuclear P53 mutations because the Sonic Hedgehog uh, activated medulloblastomas that have P53 mutations are associated with a very bad prognosis. So that is actually in the WHO is actually separated even. The, 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 
with a specification Sonny Hedgehog P53 mutant or not. And a strong P53 staining or the, or the presence of anaplasia in these Sonny Hedgehogs is actually suggestive of this uh, particular subtype that's associated with a very uh, bad behavior. Okay, the next uh, patient is a one-year-old girl that had neurologic symptoms for one week. And this is the scan. So you have again a tumor in the cerebellum. That is actually, this is the T2 weighted image here. It shows that there's a slightly cystic component, but it's, you are seeing a nice outline of the nodules. And this is the T1 post contrast weighted image that shows also these uh, very conspicuous nodularity of the tumor. And this is what you have. It's a tumor that catches your attention. You can see you're starting to see these nodules here, even at low power, that probably correspond to what you were seeing on the scan. This, this is highly typical for this tumor. Very young patient, nodule on a tumor in the in the cerebellum. You have some features. Your first impression is that probably this is a, nod, a desmoplastic nodular medulloblastoma, of course, because you have these nodules. But this is even more striking than the previous case that we saw, right? I mean, you have these nodules and you really see here excellent morphologic evidence of neuronal differentiation, of neurocytic differentiation. You have these very small cells, very little in the way of proliferation with a lot of neuropil. And the dysmoplasia is not as accentuated as others. And these nodules here tend to dominate. Some of them have these weird shapes, elongation, and it's present essentially in the vast majority of the tumor. It was almost all the tumor is composed of these nodules, where you have a lot of neuronal differentiation in the middle. You don't see these tumors very often, but uh, when you see them, this, this type of pattern, it's difficult to take your eyes off. It really catches your attention. Let's see it around. And the diagnosis is medulloblastoma with extensive nodularity. Uh, which is in some ways is related to the desmoplastic nodular but tends to occur in young children tends to be to have a, a better prognosis is usually have low, low proliferation still is assigned a grade four all the medulloblastomas are grade, grade four uh, and they are also a uh, part of these sonic hedgehog activated molecular subgroup so uh, this is also some of the, the, the similarities that you have. If you do a synaptophysing in those nodules, they will be brightly positive because they have a lot of uh, neuropil deposition in, in those. They, uh, in the past, they used to also be have the designator of advanced neuronal differentiation because their work is, is one of the most differentiated uh, medulloblastoma uh, subtypes that you, you, you're going to encounter. Uh, some of these patients also uh, can uh, can have uh, Gorlin syndrome and, and other things. So they're uh, probably part of a, of, of a uh, generalized Sonny Hedgehog uh, activated type uh, genetic syndrome is something to, to have in mind. Next case is a six-year-old uh, girl with a fourth ventricular mass. And actually, uh, at, even at the time of diagnosis, was suspected to have drop metastasis in the thoracic cord. Many of these medulloblastoma patients uh, actually get screened to see if there are any uh, lesions also in the spinal cord, because this, is, this tumor, in contrast to gliomas, tend to have a high propensity to disseminate uh, in this way. And this is the HNE slide. 
And of course, again, we have a very cellular neoplasm that appears blue at low power. I think that's the theme today. Now, there are two features here that are different from what the, the tumors that I've been showing you. One of them is that the cells are larger. This is not necessarily a small round blue cell tumor. It's the, the cells are larger and fairly discohesive. And some of them, if you look that, they really have very prominent nucleoli. A lot of apoptotic bodies, very proliferative tumor. So when you see this, you have also, you encounter this with a differential. And one of the main differentials in my uh, experience is with uh, lymphoma because the cells are fairly discohesive and have these prominent nucleoli. And this is particularly true when you look at, at the smears in, in these patients. So immunostains may be helpful here in um, uh, sorting out your differential diagnosis. Let me show you a few more, a few more of these fields. Again, a lot of apoptotic bodies, proliferation, large cells and, and you compare sometimes you can compare the cells with uh, the erythrocytes and you can see here that they're about they're for sure greater than three or four times the size of a, a erythrocyte here better areas some of them may have a little bit more uh, cytoplasm a useful marker here is synaptophysin because, like I mentioned, almost all medulloblastomas express synaptophysin of varying degrees, and this one is also synaptophysin positive. That helps you in recognizing that this is probably being in the cerebellum in a child, brown blue cell tumor with neuronal differentiation in the cerebellum that essentially tells you that you are dealing uh, most likely with a medulloblastoma, so it's very helpful. Another marker that is important to, have to, to add in these cases is INI1, because another differential diagnosis here is with a typical teratoid rhabdoid tumor. And here you have preserved INI1 expression. You have areas, I mean, of, of artifactual loss um, that happens uh, depending on the quality of the tissue and fixation and other things. But you can gather that most areas the tumor seems it has preserved INI1 reactivity, which is a normal result. So the diagnosis here is medulloblastoma. It, it was non-wind, non-sonic hedgehog. We did that by uh, immunohistochemistry characterization, but it is of the anaplastic large cell type. And this is a, a bad prognosis factor when you see it. Um, and many of these will be correspond to the group three uh, type and will have a MIC amplification. So these are aggressive tumors and we notice it here the patient had dissemination at the time of diagnosis. So that's something that everything fits together here. Unfortunately it's a, it's a bad prognostic uh, factor to have. All right so we have covered many of the medulloblastoma subtypes that we can encounter in in practice and that have prognostic relevance uh, but there are also it's important to know embryonal tumors that occur outside of the cerebellum and outside of the category of medulloblastoma that have a predilection for children but we're now seeing that this is a very heterogeneous group that has a lot of different subcategories at the time of the who classification one that came out uh, from it uh, that was specified was ETMR or embryonal tumor with multilayered rosettes that has a C19 amplicon. Uh, it's important to designate that when, it, when, when you have it, but if not, you can actually have a no otherwise specified category. And then you have others that have various patterns, mental epithelioma, CNS neuroblastoma, et cetera, that are associated with different molecular alterations. 
ATRT is also specified. Now, something that is also different from in the 2016 classification is that the ATRT requires, when you make the diagnosis, you need to document that you have I-9-1 loss or uh, loss in one of the family members, in a sense, part of the same complex. Uh, for example, BRG1 occasionally, there are rare ones that don't that have I and I1 preserved, but have BRG1 loss, for example. Uh, if you don't have that, you are not able per WHO guidelines to call it ATRT, even though you may have a lot of features that are uh, compatible with it. Uh, in those cases, the designation of embryonal tumor with rhabdoid features is appropriate. So. Uh, you, there are ways to diagnose these tumors. So let's say if you have trouble with the, your, the, the immuno or, or limited access to, to genetic testing, you can still put it in a category and recognize that the tumor has embryonal features, rhabdoid features, but ATRT requires INI1 loss for documentation for practical purposes. So there's a lot of effort, and this, this paper came around the same time. It's a, it's a very highly referenced paper uh, in which a lot of tumors uh, uh, that were uh, within the CNS category were subjected to comprehensive profiling, and there were a variety of, of things that were that cluster into known entities um, like ETMR. Some of them, uh, but then a, a few others uh, came out. And these were some four major categories. This is not in the WHO, uh, but these are categories that are uh, coming out and starting to affect uh, classifications. Uh, and, and some of them have some association with morphology. For example, you have this FOXR2 neuro that are associated with neuroblastoma-like uh, um, morphology. And then you have um, these uh, tumors with uh, CIC alterations. Some of these you see them outside of the CNS. And then you have the ones that have MN1 alterations that some of them have a morphology resembling actually more astroblastoma rather than other round blue cell tumors. And of course, B core is another area that, that, that is coming up because you can see in the CNS and outside of the CNS as well. So there's a lot of efforts and a lot of work trying to uh, uh, tease out uh, different categories. And this heterogeneous group that used to be called PNET, remember PNET has disappeared from the WHO classification and now uh, we refer to these tumors as embryonal tumors, and the advice is to try to put it in a specific category if you can. With that in mind, let's move to the next case. Uh, this is a six-year-old uh, boy with a posterior fossa mass. And this is what you have. You again are looking at a tumor that has a lot of evidence of neural differentiation. You have the, all these uh, neural peel and cells streaming and swimming in it, basically. And then you have areas that are more poorly differentiated. These aggregates, some of them are a little bit arranged in a pedivascular region. Some areas resemble a bit uh, neurocytes. And something that really helps you with the diagnosis is this. This is what you will call a multi-layered rosette. It's basically you have these cells that are primitive, kind of stacked up, uh, surrounding the rosette in a, a small, little looming in the inside. Those cells surrounding it are very proliferative in contrast to the areas that are more differentiated. Your areas are also a little bit more fully differentiated. And the rosettes can be focal, can be absent sometimes, uh, and you still can be deal. So this type of pattern is actually very suggestive of the diagnosis, even in the absence of rosettes a lot of neuropeel and this kind of streaming of cells in it, the primitive cells, young patient. So
Let's see if we have immunostains. We don't have immunostains there, but synaptophysin will be uh, strongly positive. So the diagnosis is embryonal tumor with multilayer hoses, ETMR. Remember, for this particular case, we did not confirm the C19 amplicon, but uh, so more uh, strictly speaking, this should be a, a non otherwise specified category. But this is almost li very likely to have this, the C19 amplicon, just to, something to have in mind. Um, so these are very aggressive tumors and uh, again, have a predilection for uh, for your children. They can have many different patterns. This pattern that I show you is what has been the, was described in, uh, um, in, in the past as embryonal tumor with an abundant neuropil and true rosettes that was, or a tanter by uh, Dr. Berger and Dr. Eberhard and colleagues. And um, now we have this ETMR category that encompasses other tumor uh, patterns, medulla epithelioma, uh, what we used to be called pendiomodulastoma, that actually are also are characterized by the same uh, genetic changes, uh, particularly this uh, C19 amplicon. Next case is a three year old girl with a frontoparietal mass. This way we have. So you have these uh, very interesting patterns. A lot of ribbons, a bit of a mixoid stroma. Nice, almost cribiforming in part, but a very interesting pattern. And this patient, there was no evidence of any tumor occurring outside of the CNS with a pattern like this, as this will be one thing to have in mind. Uh, but the tumor, you can see here, you have some pseudo stratification. And uh, there was some immunohistochemical evidence of neuronal differentiation. Here you can argue this a little bit. Some probably associated gliosis in the adjacent brain. More of this very interesting pattern of pseudostratified cords. So the diagnosis here was a uh, medullo epithelioma. So uh, that category is still present in the WHO. Um, it's recognized. The caveat is if this tumor, if you document that this one has what, the same C19 amplicon as ETMR, you put it in the category of ETMR. So embryonal tumor with multilayer hosed. So this could be uh, part of that category, but there are some tumors that don't have this amplicon and have this very characteristic morphology. And we still are allowed to to call these uh, medullo, medullo epitheliomas for the time being. Uh, you you have other uh, another area where you see a medullo epithelioma as a distinct category is in the eye, so that you do have medullo epitheliomas that occur in the in the eye, and some of them can have a lot of patterns, uh, teratoid elements, etc. So uh, this is another embryonal tumor that uh, that you can encounter in practice. Next patient is a 12 year old boy with a large enhancing mass in the left frontoparietal region.
And most of this neoplasm uh, has this pattern here, something that again, you have neuropeel and you have these cells that are variable in size. When you look at them, they almost look like small neurons, right? Or small ganglion cells. Sometimes I call them ganglioid in the description, but they suggest that you have a tumor that shows a very advanced uh, neuronal differentiation at the morphologic level. So you move around most of it looks like this very low proliferation so this is something that you might be tempted to place in a category of a well differentiated neoplasm either ganglios uh, ganglocytoma or um uh, extraventricular neurocytoma etc giving this very well differentiated however if you look around carefully you will have areas that are more primitive and that have very high mitotic activity. Uh, so this one is probably best placed in a category of, in a high grade category within binal tumors. Now there's no distinct pattern. This area here in particular has high nuclear cytoplasmic ratios and brace mitotic activity. So it's important to, when you have these resections, to really examine all the components because you can have a lot of variation. Let's see what we have here. This one, yeah, this is OLIC2. It's a marker uh, that we use a lot as a glioma marker, but it's also positive in many of these embryonal tumors, um, with some exceptions. Uh, this is strongly positive. The tumor was also very strongly positive for synaptophysing in those areas of uh, neuropeel. So no specific pattern. So the diagnosis here uh, that we made was CNS and brinal neoplasm and no other was specified with a long comment. And this is another category. So if this is what's probably what you will call in the past PNET or something along those lines. Uh, sometimes if you have a glial component, you can put it in the high grade glioneuronal category. Uh, but a lot of this has, shows evidence of neuronal differentiation. So it's appropriate to put it into the CNS and brinal neoplasm. If you are able to uh, characterize it further, uh, there are a variety of, of molecular uh, NGS platforms uh, that, that can, can be of help or DNA met or, or methylation platforms that can help you characterize them a little bit further. And uh, that's, that's, but many of these are, are great, great for tumors. Next case is number nine, eight-year-old girl that had this uh, right frontal lobe mass. Very cellular neoplasm. Again, you do have single cell necrosis and a lot of apoptotic bodies. The cells have these prominent nucleoli. They are not only round in areas as other round blues, uh, tumors that we've been seeing, but you also have areas in which you have a more spindle cell configuration and almost a more mesenchymal appearance. You have areas that have pseudo rosettes. Areas here are more epithelioid. Again, you're starting to see a lot of these nucleoli, maybe some eosinophilic cytoplasm in areas. So a lot of pattern variation. Mixoid stroma.
So you know you're dealing with something malignant, aggressive. Here again. Well, this makes so it's trauma. Streaming of cells. Again, something almost reminds you of a sarcoma of some kind. Okay, and uh, we did a variety of markers for these uh, in this case. Well, we initially saw it, so we were puzzled by a lot of the patterns that we were seeing in, in, in different slides. This is OLIC2, and it was negative, or you had a few cells here and there that were positive. GFAP was weakly positive in areas, but not really nothing very impressive. So there were a variety of markers that were negative. We were not, uh, didn't have a very clear uh, clue of, uh, of the phenotype. This is smooth muscle actin, which was mostly positive in vessels, but it was, we also documented it focally in a few cells. But that what helped us here was, again, I and I one. Which was negative. Uh, and not negative, but lost in the neoplastic cells. The cells that are positive are in trapped normal cells. Here's a better field that shows you that you have I and I one loss in these um, neoplastic cells and uh, with retention in internal elements. That's very important because it documents the adequacy of the immunohistochemical reaction. So you have INI1 loss, variable expression, weak expression of a variety of markers. That's a little bit of an unusual finding, but um, uh, we felt uh, confident that overall the findings were sufficient for a diagnosis of a typical uh, territory rhabdoid tumor. The rhabdoid cells were subtle, and this is not uncommon in, in ATRT. You don't always have these uh, these rhabdoid cells, they, or they, you, you have them focally in most cases, but you can have either a ROM blue cell tumor component or various patterns like these that remind you of a carcinoma or, or a, of a sarcoma or, or something along those lines. So it's, it's, it's important to have a high index of suspicion uh, in patients uh, when you encounter these, these, these patterns. Um, and I and I one here is very helpful once you exclude, of course, other tumors that can have I and I one loss. But in the CNS proper and in, in children, there are very few tumors that do that. So uh, it's very suggestive when you have I and I one. It's a, it's a very important uh, tool to use in the evaluation of, of pediatric brain tumors. Now, ATRT, with all these. Uh, Genomic studies, we now know that ATRT is not a single disease either. Uh, so there are three different uh, subtypes, at least in this, uh, this major effort here, uh, that came out uh, based on uh, the different pathways activation. This used comprehensive gene expression and methylation uh, profiling and showed that the ATRT uh, uh, TYR, Sonic Hedgehog also, as you see, you, uh, this pathway is also important for a subtype of ATRTs in addition to medulloblastoma and atrt make and they have some they are aggressive tumors they are malignant uh, but they have some uh, subtle uh, clinical and uh, difference and genetic differences so something at least is a step forward in, in trying to understand this disease a bit more uh, uh, since it's a it's a very uh, 
bad uh, player in the pediatric uh, group. Okay, we have reached the final case, 63 year old male with a left hemispheric mass. And this is what we have. This is a tumor that has a, a few areas. There are areas that appear a little bit more solid. Again, brown blue cell tumors, uh, cells packed back to back, a lot of uh, mitotic activity, a lot of mitotic activity. But if you looked around, there are areas in which you have more single cell infiltration. The cells and the cells look slightly different here. Slightly different. This looks more like a conventional infiltrating astrocytoma here. More variable. Some of the cells have more cytoplasm here mitotic activity, so you feel that probably you're not dealing with uh, gliosis at the periphery, which is always a concern with a variety of brain tumors. Draw a little bit more of this here. So we also did immunohistochemistry in this case. And of course, we are dealing with a round blue cell tumor. We want to document that the tumor had um, synaptophysin. And indeed, a lot of the tumor cells are synaptophysin positive, particularly in this, those more packed cellular areas. Next, we look for GFAP, which is our sensitive glial marker. And you see many of them are actually weakly GFAP positive at all. You may have scattered cells here and there that are positive, but a lot of, a substantial number of the tumor cells are negative in this area. And you start seeing actually other areas in which the GFAP is stronger actually. So you have a biphasic pattern by immunohistochemistry. And OLIC2 is an excellent marker to identify single cell and infiltrating uh, gliomas. And you can see OLIC2 was negative for the most part in those more uh, compact round blue cell areas, but we are starting to see uh, increase uh, in positivity in those areas that look more like a conventional infiltrating astrocytoma. So the diagnosis was a glioblastoma IDH wild type with, uh, and there was there were no IDH mutations with primitive neuronal component. Uh, this is in the past had been recognized as a glioblastoma with PNT component, but PNT has disappeared even from some of these uh, designations. So that is the more appropriate way on the WHO. And these are biphasic tumors. And many times they come they, they a proportion of the different components are variable and independent uh, individual cases. Uh, it's important to recognize it because the neuronal component oftentimes can disseminate like a embryonal tumor does, you know, through the CSF and can and anecdotally respond to some uh, tumor, some chemotherapies that are given to these uh, embryonal tumors. So it's important to have in mind for differential diagnosis purposes and for 
um, for possible to in the in the setting of occurrence. Uh, and in fact, when you see something that once you exclude something metastatic in an uh, older patient, particularly small cell carcinoma, and you see something that looks to you very embryonal, uh, and you are tempted to just call it embryonal NOS or PNT or something like that, uh, most of those cases actually will fall in the category of this in which you, you will have probably a focal uh, glial component. It will be more of a, a, a glioma with, with uh, a neuronal, uh, primitive neuronal component. Just something to have in mind in, in the adult population. Okay, with that, we finish uh, reviewing the cases and we'll go through some questions. So feel free to take a look. Uh, I'll give you some, some time to think about them and uh, send your um, comments and we'll try to address them. So the first question is, which of the following markers helps in recognizing the medulloblastoma subtype with the best prognosis? Beta-catenin, GAB1, GFAP, INI1, or JAB1? I see some answer for D that is INI1. Okay. Any others? Uh, some other thing E also that is EF1. I even see A that is beta catenin. Someone says A. There is more of A coming up. Interesting. Okay, so that's good. So beta catenin is actually what I was thinking of. So the, the medulloblastoma subtype with the best prognosis is the wind activated. And the a most straightforward way to test for these is to look for beta uh, catenin accumulation in the nucleus. Some of these also have JAP1, but JAP1 is non specific since it also. Express in Sonic Hedgehog uh, subtype I91, and what I mean here is by I91 loss, you see it is it's a marker of ATRT. So exp expression is retained pretty much in every medulloblastoma, but loss in ATRT. So the, here the answer was beta catenin. Next question Which of the following alterations is particularly associated with a bad prognosis in Sonic Hedgehog activated medulloblastoma? I see monosomy six, that is D. Yeah, there is more of D. That's uh, monosomy six. Okay. Um, I also see E, P53 mutation. Okay. And actually, that's the answer, P53. So uh, monosomy 6 is actually a good prognostic marker. It's, it's, it's associated with this wind-activated subgroup. EGF amplification, you usually don't see it in, uh, in blastoma. It's more atypical of uh, primary glioblastomas. But the P53 mutation is, is, is important. And actually, there is a category. It's, a, it's good to designate it. If you're able to test for that in the Sonic Hedgehog subgroup, it is a, it's an important destination to have because the, the sonic hedgehog tumors that have p53 mutation they often have anaplasia and they are actually associated with a very aggressive behavior so p53 mutation in this within this specific subgroup is a bad prognostic sign next what is the genetic alteration most characteristic of embryonal tumor with multi-layered rosettes I already see 
A, that is T19 microRNA cluster amplification. And that, in fact, is correct. So this is a, a small cluster of microRNAs that are amplified in the chromosome 19. That is almost definition of the entity. So uh, uh, it's, it's, it's another one that can be tested by a variety of techniques. But there are some morphologies, particularly this etanthro or, or embryonal uh, uh, tumor with abundant neural peel and true rosettes that are highly characteristic of, of, of these. And, and, and almost all of them have this uh, SC19 uh, cluster amplification. All right, final question. 58 year old male presented with a right hemispheric mass, and the biopsy reveals a cellular neoplasm with bridge mitotic activity and necrosis. Composed of round cells that strongly express synaptophysic and RGFAP. An extracranial primary is excluded on clinical grounds. Which of the following is most likely? I can see some answers with C, that is ETMR, but uh, let's wait. Yeah, I see more of C, that is ETMR. Anything else? Well, embryonal neoplasm NOS, uh, someone also mentioned, SUMA. Say that it's uh, embryonal neoplasm NAS. Actually, mm -hmm. the answer is D. D. Yeah, um, there is more of the. Okay, so glioblastoma with primitive neuronal component. ETMR is usually occurs in young patients. So a 58 year old with an ETMR will be exceptional. It's, it's something that almost essentially will be very difficult to encounter. Um, and here in Brana NOS, maybe the way that you have to approach it and maybe even diagnose it, uh, so if you only have an area that looks embryonal. But in most of these cases, that, that wasn't the message of the, that's why I wanted to illustrate this, this case of glioblastoma with primitive neuronal component. You can have it and it can be the dominant component almost. And it is a diagnosis that is much more common in the adult population. So if you have something like that, it's more likely you're going to have a glioma that has a embryonal component rather than an embryonal tumor like you will encounter in, in, um, in the pediatric population. So it's just something to have in mind to look very carefully. If you don't have a glioma, component you cannot call it but at least you can speculate or or in some ways convey that you know particularly in small biopsies that uh, there's still a, a possibility that you can have a, a concurrent glial component in this scenario particularly at the older age spectrum remember you can have medulloblastomas and embryonal tumors in young adults in you know in, in their 20s 30s but once you start getting a little bit on the older uh, tail of, of age uh, it, they become much more unlikely and gliomas become more likely uh, uh, in that context. All right, so I think that uh, finishes all the questions and I uh, hope this was of uh, uh, utility to all of you. Thank you for your attention. I uh, just wanted to outline here the, the series. We are actually halfway over all the topics that we're covering in the CNS. Next month, we'll be talking about uh, tumors of the pineal region and a few other topics that are uh, interesting uh, through the remaining of the year so you are aware of and of course if you cannot join us you can always uh, look at them in the recorded there's also uh this was also placed by pathcast if all the neuropath lectures are now in um uh, together, uh, you can view them view them together in a playlist, either in Facebook or YouTube. This is the Facebook link, so you will be able to uh, take a look at them uh, on your own convenience. And if you want to go through them systematically or a specific topic that you may have issues with. Uh, and also, if you want to uh, contact us, 
we have a new website here for the surgical neuropathology group. So um, that can contact has contact information, has brain tumor basics. It's more geared to our patients for patient education uh, in uh, to see what we do, uh, but also has um, uh, uh, our uh, contact information in case you want to to share cases or you have any any questions or or we can help you in any uh, with any issues. So uh, just another tool to have in mind. And uh, with that, I think uh, I'll hope to uh, see you in the next uh, session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez, for the, for your uh, lecture on uh, this um, important topic. And thanks to all the viewers. And uh, stay tuned for Dr. Rodriguez's next lecture that is coming up on August 27th. And he would be discussing tumors of the pineal region. And you all are most welcome to continue your support. And please like our Facebook page, that is Patcast, and our uh, YouTube channel. Please subscribe and also subscribe to our newsletter by logging on to our website, that is www.pathologicast.com. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.